Action Hall meeting that we're at uh, 5.33. First thing on the agenda is reception of guests. So uh, we have one guest, it looks like, this evening. Uh, Michael. So first item on our agenda is reception of guests, so we are receiving you. Um, I assume that you're here to listen in and possibly comment about Act 26 discussions, or yeah, okay. That's the. Uh, it's the last item on our discussion agenda. Are there any uh, agenda revision or board comments? Are there any public comments or correspondence? Okay, and I'm going to ask for a motion to uh, approve the minutes of October 24th. Steve Banks, is there a second? Floor? Is there any discussion of the draft minutes of October 24th? Give one minute to decline their review. Hearing now, all those in favor of approving the minutes of October 24th, please say aye. Aye. Opposed? Abstentions? Motion carries. Uh, first item on our discussion agenda is going to be led by uh, Floor. And I'm going to let her explain uh, what it is and what we're going to be doing. Some of us don't know everybody's name, but especially some of us don't know where you come from. So the activity is uh, is saying to the bird. So for example, if it's myself, I will say, I belong to Guatemala, and you go and introduce yourself to you know whoever it is. So this afternoon, with Darcy, and said, I I belong to Guatemala. My name is Flor. I belong to you. But it has to be meaningful, like do eye contact and. The one thing that could go wrong, and she said this too, is that in North American culture, belonging sometimes is associated with possession. So don't assume that. You know, it's it's going to be neutral, and it's not it's not about possession. And then we'll this is kind of like a surprise, and then we'll debrief when you're done. So you're gonna yeah. You might just want to add it comes from the country of your relatives if you're far back. She was talking about that. Oh, yes. Yes. Like, I'm all the way back to 15th century. My, my relatives have been in North America, so I've been all the way back to there. Yeah, and in the, when we did the workshop, said, when you say where you feel, I, to me, I belong to what I just, even though my heart is here, my home is here, I still feel like that's who made me who I am. But for some people, belonging could be as far as your you know, where your ancestors come. But the lobby could also be Vermont, because this is where you belong right now. So it's gonna be different for, for for everybody. So just say what you truly feel. And I'm gonna time us, and we're gonna go around. Is, is there any questions? And please try to do it, not just with the people that you feel comfortable with. And this includes all administrators, and minute takers, and videographers. 
So, it, and all community members, Michael, that includes you, which are very distracted there, right? It's something that includes you going around your room, right? It's for community too. I know you're looking at me like I don't want to do this, but it, and you should start to your right, okay? Mike, not everybody. So, so let's get started. So, no, no, start. No, just you have to get up and move around the, around the room. I was teasing Michael that he needed to start. to share of how they felt or if there was any awkwardness or anything, any comments? I mean, I can make any situation awkward. So. <laughs> <laughs> um, I will say that as an uh, introvert by nature, it's pretty hard to, to walk up to folks and say I belong to them. Um, it got easier as you Anybody else? Nobody else? So, what, and that's basically what is sort of radical about this activity. What I was, what I was hoping is that we understand our interdependence in each other, and as we are embarking in this new, you know, in this new adventure together, this to me radical activity. It is the start of how we write a new story. So when, when we understand that we're interdependent in each other, we, we understand that our behaviors affect everybody, that our way of seeing each other affects the story that we write. So as we embark in our meeting today, we need to understand it how do, how do we get people to think about each other different? And I, through the process of Act 46, at least myself, I've seen so many mindsets already made about each other. And each of us has more than one story, even if we don't agree with whatever it is, Act 46 or something else. We, besides that, we have more to say, and we have more to contribute. So I'm hoping that we can use this as a, as a start of that new of that new story and creating that belonging to me what I was most afraid of doing this was that I hope that you understand that it's not possession that belonging doesn't mean that you change completely your mind that belonging doesn't mean like I belong to my kids and my husband it doesn't mean that I just do what they tell me to do right so it's similar so we all belong in this together for the kids and the last thing I want to say that Caroline said at this meeting too was that the assumptions made as we're headed to Monterey, 
the assumptions made by adults, by ourselves, or teachers, or board members, it has more impact in the achievement gap sometimes than any other thing. That's it. So hopefully you enjoyed it. Thanks, board. So not to turn too business-like, but we all belong to the same budget, which happens to be the next thing on our agenda. So uh, that's on page nine, and I'll ask Bill to, to take us through the presentation on that. Thanks, Matthew. This year's budget, just to stand up. Uh, as you can see at the bottom, and most of you are used to seeing the budgets in format that we present them to you, is a total of a 1.96% increase for Washington Central. Um, the biggest impact on that, and it's really been this cost of changing this, of staff. Um, there are other areas in there that are reimbursed as state place students. And our biggest increase across there, as you'll see, you see at the bottom, you can see that percentage, but there's also changes in the revenue. So one of the things that we talked a lot in the executive committee, and I know we talked to all the local boards about, was that um, we, with the change in assessments from last year, and I'm gonna have you uh, change, turn the page to page 10. You can see at the bottom for budget 2018-2019, we have three assessments. We have the SU assessment, the transportation assessment, and the special education assessment. You can see the transportation assessment and SU assessment have been close to flat. Our biggest uh, change has been special education. And as we've talked about many times in local board meetings and here at the SU, we're seeing a tick in needs, for student needs, so that's a response to those. Um, also, the equalized pupils that are set on this page are estimates. We still have not been able to get from the agency of education the actual. Um, the work that Lori does with her team and Michelle Stefka, they, I'm sure these estimates are probably within plus or minus a percentage or two. But that's what is there right now. And you will see at the bottom there the increase or decrease in assessments based on the change in the equalizer. I'll just remind you that last year this board changed the assessment methodology that we're doing everything on the average daily membership. Oh, equalizer peoples, thank you. Equalizer peoples. Thank you. Sorry, I should read the page. Um, or is there anything else major that I could I'll give you the short version, Matt. I'm more than Matthew, I'm more than willing to take more questions, but just trying to get to the point of the budget. Yeah, I would, before opening up for questions or discussion, I would also just add that the executive committee has formally recommended this budget to the SU board uh, after two meetings on November 6th and November 20th, where we uh, discussed it. Uh, there were a lot of issues that, that came up in our conversation about the budget. But in the end, we decided not to try to alter the budget as presented, but rather to accept it as presented. Um, that, be, that being said, the next item on our agenda after talking about the budget is to kind of get into the various issues that uh, came up because of those conversations. Um, so with that said, does anybody have any specific uh, questions about the budget as presented that I'd like to ask? seeing any, typically what the SU board would do at this point would be to um, consider a motion to uh, approve the budget or recommend it to the voters for, for approval. Um, this year, as I think everyone is aware, and as I'm almost certain we will discuss a bit later, uh, there is a process that's been laid out for us whereby a transitional board or a transition board uh, would be responsible for recommending a draft budget to what would become the new uh, district board. Um, so 
so with that in mind, it seemed appropriate to uh, make a motion to recommend the approval of the, the 2019 to 2020 budget of a certain amount assessed by equalized pupils to the transition board. Um, I do have specific language here that asks somebody near me to make that motion. you want to express that in the form of a motion that we table it until uh, friendly request to table. Okay. Friendly request to table. Yeah. Is there any objection to tabling the motion until uh, after we have the discussion about uh, educational priorities and goals? I guess um, so maybe just a point of order. I, I don't think we need to table this call to be addressed in the action items. And I think Chris's request could just be that he doesn't want to make an agenda adjustment and we should vote in the action items. Okay. Yeah, fair enough. We can do that. Yeah, of course. So we have, yeah, go ahead. We have one other uh, motion that we need to make too. We'll just save that one for later. I think. Yeah, yeah. I think we just do about the action. Yeah, sounds good. Uh, so with that, we'll move to 3.3, which is um, the topic is goal number two or, or student learning. Um, and just to kind of provide the context or the background on on this, um, I think everyone is aware that we've been talking about um, student learning outcomes and educational priorities and, and goals uh, to some extent or another, uh, at least since June, if not uh, farther back than that. Um, when the, I'm kind of mixing up a little bit, the School Quality Committee um, memo and the Executive Committee report, but again, just to explain, um, when the draft budget was first brought to the Executive Committee on November 6th, and you know, we noted that it had a, a, a relatively modest increase of Two percent. Uh, we asked Bill if he uh, could talk to the leadership team and consider uh, investments that might possibly uh, contribute to improving uh, student educational outcomes, particularly in the area of, of math. Uh, we talked a little bit about um, an idea that had been discussed in the past, which is around um, uh, professional coaching uh, for math teachers, and specifically perhaps uh, augmenting the coaching that's already happening uh, in the system, but also said to please um, you know, take some latitude in considering what might be the best recommendation or um, best investment uh, for the executive committee and then this board to, to consider. Um, essentially, I don't know, Bill, if you want to uh, kind of give a, a snapshot of the response that you gave to the executive committee. and, it, and I just want to say, but sorry, Phil, um, but this relates to this board and asked the school quality committee to come back and recommend uh, some things that we could prioritize or make into educational goals. Um, and so that's also in here. And we're just kind of going to go step by step and try to get everyone's uh, input here. Thank you, Matthew. I thought maybe the best thing I could do is talk to you a little bit about the process the leadership team went through. <coughs> 
talk to you a little bit about what we did that day. I've asked the leadership team to uh, be willing to jump in if they wanted. If I miss something from that day, it was a, um, I, I want to say with all sincerity, we really appreciate the question because it made us kind of stop and think for, for six hours. Um, along with many other things we do, but it's one of those kind of like stop from the operations kind of step back for a minute. It, I also want to uh, foreshadow before I get much into this that this has only been discussed with the leadership team. And that's not a theoretical way that I would want to work in trying to move something forward. So what I'm going to tell you is about it is a discussion that happened with the leadership team. It hasn't happened with the staff. And um, I said to the executive committee, and I've said to some of the boards that I've talked to about this, or individual board members, that one of my um, reflections on the past six years working in Washington Central is that when the boards get out ahead of where the staff is, is there's some, there's some, um, I think the best word is just misinformation. And the same thing happens when it goes the other way. If the staff's out in front, the board doesn't. So I'm, uh, I'm going to give you some themes. I probably You'll probably want a lot more details, and I won't be willing to give them to you because we have to work with our staff all the time. And it's not fair for them not to be in this discussion. Uh, they need to be part of this discussion. They deserve to be part of this discussion. And therefore, we're going to give you some themes from that day. Uh, and I, I, I know I'm going to tap some of my colleagues out here, uh, especially about some of the details. So. In the October 20, uh, 2018 leadership team set for the math goals. You asked for those. We came back from working with every teacher of math. One of the things that we know is effective, uh, it's been shown effective in district leadership work, is that there's collaboratively set goals throughout the system. So we asked every teacher of math, we said, you have so many students that are proficient in September. How many will be proficient in June? Tell us what that is. And then how many students can make a year's worth of growth? You saw that back in October in this room. We presented you that goal and that data. Our teachers did a great job of that work, um, and we, we compiled all that. On November 6th, the, exec, you asked the, the executive committee on November 6th asked the leadership team, me, myself, and the leadership team, what resources do the schools need in the next year to improve student performance in math? To that end, the leadership team took up the question at their meeting on November 13th. We are prepared to share with you the process that we did, um, but really, as I said before, to fully answer this question, we need to engage the entire staff of Washington Central. And I want to ensure that that happens. Um, so I'm not going to say that this is a finished project, uh, but we have work to do. On November 13th, the leadership team met for six hours. We, reviewed, we started by reviewing research kind of took a step back and said, what's the research telling us about what's effective for math instruction and what works? And quickly we got into a discussion of what works generally in all of education. And really at lunchtime we kind of had to refocus back on math. And at that point one of my colleagues, uh, Amy Toss, said, hey, we were using a protocol, it's called the Future Protocol, we used it for looking forward, it's a good one for planning. But she said, we really have to ask why we're getting the results we're getting. And what, why do we have the math results? It's called the five whys. And you ask why five times. I didn't bring the chart paper with us, but you start to brainstorm what are the reasons. And one of the things we didn't expect to come up, because we were talking a lot about teaching practices and uh, student scores and student performance, we actually got to our community. And our biggest why that came up, and it's our number one for us, is our community engagement about why math is important. We actually tracked back, and we didn't literally go through minutes, but most of us on the leadership team said we couldn't remember a time that science, math, or technology was talked about in the board meeting. We've heard a lot more about arts and music, and so we really came to a place that our, we're not sure that our community values math and values STEM. Uh, we hear a lot of adults that talk about, I'm not good at math, I'm not a math brain, I don't have a math gene. Those last two, that's not true, that's been proved through cognitive science. Um, there isn't a certain gene or there isn't a certain brain for learning a certain content area. It may be harder for me, it's about writing and reading, it's really hard for me. But with good effort, I can, I can get there. 
and I actually am experiencing that in my doctoral work right now. Um, so it's really, it's knowing that. So after those whys, we came from four major strategy areas. We need to have a strong community engagement about why math is important. Uh, I can tell you just tonight, you know, we have a theater performance, whether it's an elementary theater or U32, we pack the house. There's a math night going up in Berlin, Berlin right now. There were, what was it, Jen, 13 or 17? 13. 13 parents let us know they were coming. We have some community engagement to do about why math is important. Professional growth and high, in support of high quality math instruction. We need our best math teachers, teaching our students who need the most support. Traditionally in schools in the United States, those who have the most experience get the choice of classes they teach. We need to turn that around. Um, structure, we need to look at structure, structural changes in the system, specifically more time for instruction and professional collaboration. We know right now that the recommendation of best practice math instruction is 60 minutes a day of math instruction. We do not have that in this SU. Um, and we need more work on good work, a good one is student work analysis or student uh, studying you know how are students answering questions and why are they getting the results that they are so we can look at our teaching practices that's about professional collaboration that's just one example and the last one is meeting students social emotional needs i was in a conversation this morning with one of my colleague principals who's here and we were talking about a student in math that was performing high they aren't now and it's not because of math and something has changed in their background, and we need to attend to those social emotional needs so they can be accessible to them. Um, so those are the four major themes, and we went into a two hour discussion if you want to go watch the Oregon site. It was kind of interesting to see how long we were talking about this. But um, Matthew, if you want some more detail, we'll be glad to get it, but I just kind of thought I'd get those highlights. No, I appreciate that. And just for people's reference, um, those items that Bill just described are also outlined in the minutes of the executive committee meeting on page uh, 17 of the packet. Um, but basically, as Bill said, it, it sparked a fairly involved uh, conversation on the part of the executive committee. I think, um, I don't know if it would be right to characterize Response that Bill just gave to the question that we posed in this way, but I, but I will do that, which is essentially that there are a lot of things that, that we could do as a board. We could uh, set aside some money for math coaching. We could um, set aside money for extra in-service days. We could um, look at um, you know lengthening the school day or the school calendar over the course of the year. You know, those are all things that kind of came up in that conversation, um, but. Any of those things in isolation would essentially be a kind of ad hoc, um, you know, improvised stopgap approach. It wouldn't be systemic. It wouldn't be driven by a kind of holistic view of the challenge of how do we raise um, math uh, proficiency in particular for all students across the board. Um, and then if you want to do that, it requires, um, you know, as a very first order of business, prioritizing that. As a board and saying that's really important to us um, and if it's if it turns out that we uh, can't be all things to all kids which I think actually is the case personally um, then you know there are some very important things that we can be to all kids and what are those things um, can we name them uh, and what are we willing to uh, do and support and possibly trade off um, in support of those things that we so that was the conversation. Um, I felt that the, um, the school quality committee produced a memo separately, which actually spoke rather, rather well to um, a way to maybe approach kind of answering those questions or looking at them. So Ms. Carr, if you don't mind, I'd like to ask you to kind of run through what you put in the memo. Sure, so hi everybody, I'm Carrie Bradley. I'm on the school quality committee and good to be with you. Hopefully moving forward on our goal number two, which is uh, 
really try to advance student learning using the monitoring report that we received back in October. So the committee uh, spent some time with the report and we spent a fair amount of time looking at this goal um, and reached the conclusion that there's a lot to like in this goal. Um, it, it has some specific targets, which we appreciate. It is uses, objectively measures uh, performance. It's time-based. It ends up being a short-term goal. Uh, originally, we had thought of a, a longer time horizon, but this is what the staff came back with, and it seemed um, uh, in, in, to us uh, somewhat ambitious, actually, as we were looking at it. So, so remember that we're talking about the percentage of students that um, reach proficiency by the year end, averaged across the SU. We're talking about moving from 45 to 71 percent. I think. We actually achieve that by this end of this year. I think we should all be hopefully pretty satisfied with that. Um, so, um, and maybe most importantly, um, it's described that this this came from the staff. This came from the teachers, and we really like the fact that they're empowered and working together and using data, looking at the same things that we are um, to the same end. And we want to kind of encourage that and foster that kind of activity. So. Um, so, uh, so we have four, in that context, four recommendations for you to consider. One is to simply um, adopt this set of goals or endorse it, however you want to put it. But they basically say, go forth and, um, and, and pursue these targets. They're, they're good ones, and um, we will support you. The second one is not, not to stop there, but also to set um, comparable goals in the, in the literacy. So like these two areas, um, at least from the members of the School Quality Committee, um, our top priorities and we really should be asking for more in both areas. So again, short-term, one-year type goals, but, um, uh, you know, and, and we're very cognizant of um, not wanting to push too hard, but push the appropriate amount and ask for what we're really looking for for kids. The third one would be uh, calling for some reflection, formal you know, reflection at the end of the, Year to see how did it go, what, what did um, how, how did we perform, what did we learn from this process of, of setting this type of goal and then going um, trying to achieve it, um, and then finally um, to use all of that learning to then go and, and set or propose some some longer term goals, three to five year type of goals along these lines, again for significant improvement is what we're looking for. Um, And I think one of the things that you know, we're very aware of is that we are, for the most part, on the committee and on, on, on the SU board, we're not the experts in, in how to um, improve education. We know we can, we can speak to the priorities and what we think um, we should really be focused on. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit more about that, but we really rely on our staff to define what are the appropriate targets over what time period and, um, and what are the resources we need to, to do that. So we're really thinking of this as that iterative process where we define the priorities. As, uh, our employees come back and say, here's, here's what we think we can do and what we need. Then we can respond to that and say, okay, that's appropriate or something else. Um, and then we all hopefully end up all aligned moving forward. So I, I can um, try to answer any questions you have, and then we can maybe talk about the recommendations. Uh, this is a really tough problem. <clears throat> One question I've got is, you know, in setting these goals, I mean, should we be having really outside, I mean, goals can be set to be attained, if you know what I mean. I mean, math, math from my experience with math, math is a, it's a cumulative knowledge that you cannot have, you know, if you have a bad influence for a short period of time, it can really hurt your ability to advance in mathematics. So you need a really good field in the, without any weaknesses in the teaching. And we assess ourselves, our, we assess our goals. Should we actually have something, somebody, an objective, source outside looking at that, looking at levels of proficiency, you know, in our teachers or 
looking at even our goal setting to make sure that they're actually realistic in terms of what we are, what we need to end up with at the end. And I, this is a tough thing. I'm not throwing stones at anybody, but I, our system has been failing here. And I, words are one thing, but I don't see the solutions really fixing this problem unless we really get objective and we really look at goals carefully. And, they, and these may be hard, you know, this may take a hard look at what we're doing. Is that working? I don't think that's working. But, I'm probably dead. I'll just talk louder. Anyway, I think that, that would be, I mean, perhaps that's one of the places where we need to really take a look at how we're evaluating and setting our goals to increase that objectivity and you know, both uh, say that, I mean, I would actually be interested in bringing in some real experts in math, not so much in, in even teaching, but saying, you know, are these realistic, I mean, what do we need to be teaching these kids before we get to, if we want to grow them into proficient uh, users of mathematics in college and engineering areas like that. I mean, we're really failing pretty dramatically here. I've experienced with my my kid and I and have in the past, and I I'm concerned that we just keep beating this, pushing this down the road. And I know we're making effort here, but I, I don't actually see solutions right now that I would necessarily trust. Do you want to that? Yeah. So. <laughs> I think there's a couple of themes in there. One is, is just on measurement. You <coughs> spoke about sort of using objective measures. And, and I, I take us back to the monitor report. And the system that we're developing uh, uses at least three different sources, right? We've got report card data. We've got the local assessment, which is really what this goal um, is focused on, is the, is the, the local assessment. But, but then we're also using external assessments as well. and so. Uh, and none of, none of it is perfect. I mean, none of it is really close to perfect right now, but we're, we're building a system that hopefully is getting us closer. And as we go through this process of goal setting and refining, I think that it will get better. The other part of your concern, I think, is about what resources, what outside the system are we using to improve the system that we have? And I think Bill or Jen might be better suited to that. I'll, I'll start and I'm going to hand it off to Jen real quick. Um, <coughs> For those that weren't on the board five years ago, I'm looking at Jen, Brad Blitzel, national expert in math, came up and did a whole audit of our math system. He laid us out in a probably five to 10 year roadmap of work to do. It's actually been slowed somewhat to resources, but that's what started our math coaching. So that piece, we've been following that roadmap. We've been very aligned to the common core standards. Um, the other piece from what's showing in district leadership that works is that you really need to empower your staff. Bringing something from the outside really doesn't cause much change. It causes a short-term bump, but a long-term dip. And that you really need to grow your professional knowledge of your staff. So I'm gonna, Jen, would you please add some more to this? So there have been a number of inputs over the years in the area of mathematics and um, Bill mentioned the comprehensive and collaborative review that we engaged in. We had some field specialists from the state of Vermont and that entire study was overseen by Brad Witzel. That was, a, um, in, in some ways, we replicated a model that had been uh, well received and successful here a few years prior to that. And that was sort of an external audit or review of literacy practices that had been conducted by Marge Lipson that led to some effective PD and changes in practice and some hiring of internal resources as well for a while. Um, so we replicated that process so that we could get an understanding of what our current strengths were, were and what our needs were. The other thing that happened was the, you know, the adoption of the Common Core State Standards. So there's been a lot of learning about the Common Core State Standards, not only the content in the standards, but the mathematical practices. We have um, hosted 
uh, Mathematics Lab School. For, uh, we hosted that in 2013 and 2014, and actually all of our administrators over the years have participated in a math lab school, either the ones that we've hosted or since we spread that um, opportunity around the region, they have attended in other neighboring schools as well. Many, many of our teachers of mathematics have taken part in that math lab school. We partnered with a neighboring district that was engaged in very similar work so that we could put a lot of heads together around creating some common benchmark assessments in mathematics that were aligned to what, um, in the beginning phases of this work, we called non-negotiables. Now that we have student learning outcomes and standards and performance indicators, um, now the benchmark assessments are aligned to our performance indicators for kids. We've um, done some in-house work over the years with an external facilitator, um, but I think the, the biggest uh, investment has been in learning about effective practices around instructional coaching. We've had your support to do that. We have increased the amount of FTE in our instructional coaching in the area of mathematics, and we're getting smarter and smarter about how best to deploy that resource. In the very beginning, we had one math coach for the entire supervisory union. She worked 0.5 FTE, um, so you know, two and a half days a week, essentially, um, over six schools was, was not much. And so we've tried to structure that resource over the years, and, um, and now we've invested a little bit more in coaching, um, not just in math, but in other um, areas of coaching as well in some of our schools. I would say the other thing is that we've been engaging in some in-house professional learning around um, what we call curriculum topic study, where we really do some unpacking of a particular unit or lesson together uh, and plan, and we engage in lesson study where we all plan a lesson together. Um, somebody volunteers to teach that lesson. We all have roles and um, observe and then debrief. So those are some of our recent inputs. So. Thanks to both of you for sharing that context. I just want to say as a board member, I, I and a member of the School Quality Committee, I really appreciate the what I see as a really strategic and methodical approach on the part of the leadership within our supervisory unit around improving instruction and student outcomes around math. And as a board member, I feel like it's incumbent on all of us to really support that leadership, number one, but also really nurture a culture of boldness with our staff and our faculty, boldness in setting audacious goals and trying new things based on the best learning out there about what might work, and also really fearless reflection um, and learning through the process. So I guess I, I've been just really committed as a board member to supporting the work that the leadership team has been doing in um, setting these goals and want to really encourage them to be able to be very honest in their reflection around what works, what doesn't work, and what to do with that going forward. And I hope we can all do that and that the new board can continue in that spirit. So I'll just add my uh, probably the same thoughts that I shared at the, the executive committee. Um, I agree completely with the school quality committee that um, there might be a few board members that have some expertise, but I think in general we're not the ones to say how to get there. I think as boards, it's our responsibility to say, and, and Rick, I use words very similar to yours, that our math results are unacceptable. I mean, a point blank blunt. I think I was pretty blunt in that meeting, Jen. I, I had to apologize a few times, but um, they're not acceptable. As a board, as boards, we need to say those math results are not acceptable. So the staff got together and came up and said, this is what we want to accomplish at the end of the year. I, I'm in agreement with some of the other discussions that I've heard that they seem a little ambitious, but if we get there, then awesome. But as a board, it's our responsibility to say this is a priority. And if we establish it as a priority, 
in the executive committee, we weren't even confident saying across all board members, this is in fact a priority. If it is a priority, then <clears throat> we all need to express that priority. And when the inevitable conflicts come up with finances or time, we as board members need to say, this is a priority. It has, it's higher up, it's more important than these other things. And if we've got infinite, if we've got a set number of resources, we may need to reallocate some of those resources. We've only got X number of minutes in a day, and if we're not spending enough time instructing math in a day, we need to spend more time instructing math, and where is that time going to come from? And as board members, if we establish that as a priority, then we need to hear back from our leadership and staff to say, to make that happen, this is what has to occur, and we have to support that. Scott? Um, I agree that math is foundational, just like literacy. And in fact, literacy and numeracy, because they're foundational, they can be developed in just about every single thing that a student does throughout his or her school day, whether it's art with um, perspective, proportions, um, geometrical relations, whether it's social studies, with statistics, there, it, it just, there's no limit to it. But um, what you said, Bill, earlier made sense to me that um, the real core of this has to be the teachers. Uh, most of the people I know who have, who are either really excited about math or who detest it can trace that feeling back to a school experience they had with a teacher who was either very inspiring or who traumatized them um, in math class. So I think although the idea of setting a goal of um, a certain proficiency goal, I think is, is great. Um, I, I'm a little bit worried about the law of reversed effort here, that the harder you try to reach or to push everybody towards proficiency, the more difficult it will actually be to get there. I would, I would be very happy to see a goal of, you know, 80% of the students will love doing math. You know, even if they're not particularly good at it, if they love doing it, then willy-nilly they'll, they'll get somewhere with it. If they hate it, it doesn't matter how many hours you give them or how much money you throw at the problem. It just won't work. Um, I'll just put on my cheerleader hat a little bit um, because I, first I agree with everything that's been said. Um, I, I agree to see that the numbers that are received here are, are not acceptable. Look at East Montpelier, and yay, 74% of our students made a year's growth, but that means that 26% didn't, and we're leaving those kids behind. And that means that next year is going to be harder, and that means that the year after that is going to be even harder. Um, so, from, a, from an educational perspective, that's a major, major problem. Um, so, that didn't sound very cheerleader like. <laughs> <laughs> In every problem is an opportunity. And I think that, you know, I was reading down through this, and the thing that really leapt out at me is the societally it's acceptable to say I don't do math. How many people in this room have said those words at some point? Probably just about everybody. I'm in a STEM field, and I've said those words. And it's culturally acceptable to hate math. And there's a real opportunity there. Maybe this school system needs to become math positive. You know, we're a lot of other things positive. We're really cheerleading about a lot of things, and it's great. Um, but, you know, we've got a great drama program, and 
impact the house, but we, but that culture is not in place. So there's a, a clear opportunity to change the way that we think about that. And one of the things that struck me is the bus stop conversations that I've had from the time that my now college student was going to elementary school, continuing on through this day, which is the parents say, I have no idea how to get this homework, and this is third grade. So there may be little things that cost nothing. Our knee-jerk reaction is often to like throw money at a problem and say, okay, we just need to throw some money over here and bring in a consultant and do this stuff. But uh, I think there's opportunity to think creatively and say, maybe we need, you know, we're likely going to be a unified district. Maybe as a district, we do parent bath night a couple of these times a year. And we teach the parents what it is that we're teaching the kids, so that when the kids bring the stuff home, the parents don't throw their hands up at the parents and say, I hate math, and instill that same culture into the next generation. So I, I guess that's that's my truth. And it seems to me like there's a pretty clear opportunity for, for sort of changing our approach around this. Um, and yes, professional development and all of those things, of course, um, are critical, but um, I think we need to change our mindset around <clears throat> I know that I, I always feel like I'm a step behind, but I, I'm actually not entirely clear what goal, the goal number two, that we're supposed to be endorsing is. So I've, I've looked at all the materials, and what I see is I see discussions of, well, develop a more thorough database understanding of student learning in RSU to inform board level strategies, budgets, monitoring, and communication. So I, I definitely see a lot of talk about things that we should do, but I don't, for me, a goal feels like a concrete thing, and I'm not, I also, we've, we've had some talk about improving our student performance outcomes, but I haven't ever heard a specific number. So I don't know exactly what the goal is that we're talking about improving. Approving. And the second question I have is, I feel like we're talking about this as if we're starting at zero and we're on a constant trajectory, but I also have had trouble when I look at the state website, and I know testing has changed, but finding out how we have done over time. For instance, have we always, did we start lower? I don't think we did start lower. In fact, I know we didn't start lower than this because I did find some data in some cases, but we have done better at some points, and we have done worse at some points, and so rather than considering all these new strategies, I would be interested to know when were we doing better and trying to reflect upon what changes have happened. Do we have any data and records? I mean, those are hard things to look at. It's a lot of, it's a big question, but um, I'm not entirely sure where to go to get good data on how our students have done over time so that we can try to see what programs were in place at those times. So Allison, to get to the data piece, what happened with the Common Core is it shifted the learning targets for math. At about fourth grade, and Jen, jump in here when I get out of my memory. Um, the about fourth or fifth grade, what used to be a fifth grade target is now a fourth grade target. So if we look at old testing data, it's testing, it's assessing different levels of knowledge of math. Not only the level of knowledge of math, but the complexity of math. So with the SBAC and the Common Core, we raise the bar quite a bit on what a student needs to know at, at grade levels. So if we go back and look at ECAP assessments or old NSREs, which I've gone back when I first came, I went back and did a comprehensive data analysis of Washington Central over the years. What I can tell you is student performance and literacy and math, no matter which measure you take, our performance has really not changed. It hasn't changed in literacy. It may have changed two or three points. Last time we did a major literacy, but that's two or three percentages. We've been constantly around 70%. What time period? Uh, anything from 2000, 1998 forward, depending on which measures you use. And are you comparing us to ourselves or to other populations of students? To ourselves, because it, it's, a, it's a percentage. It's not a comparison. It's not a norm reference compared to some other population. It's about being, meeting the standard or being proficient in today's language. So it's meeting targets of what students are supposed to be able to do, know and how many are 
proficient before we used to call it meet, meeting the standard. So can I make sure I understand, you're saying that our, what we expect of proficiency has increased, so now we expect 100 units of knowledge instead of 50, but we've hovered around 70%, so maybe we've gone from 70% of kids knowing 50 units of knowledge. No, you can't do that, Allison. You can't do that with the data. Okay. You, you can't do that. You have to say how many kids were proficient at that time. And so in literacy, I'm giving you some literacy data right now. I haven't even gotten into that. In literacy, whether you measure with NSREs, which are back in the 90s to early 2000s, NECAP, which came about 2005 to 2013 or 14, or SBAC, where the standards have changed a little bit, they've gotten more in depth, so the complexity has gone up, our literacy scores are somewhere in the high 60s to the low 70s. We've stayed in that area, about right in depth. So when you go to math, before the Common Core, the targets were about the same, either on the NECAP or the New Standards Reference Exam, which goes all the way back to 98. We used to have performance in math between about 45 and 50 percent of students were on standards. When we came to the Common Core, there was a huge shift in the target of what we call proficient or meeting the standard. And with that shift, and I'm telling you, in about fourth grade, it's already a grade level difference. And remember, these, as Rick was saying, all learning progressions, whether it's literacy or math, they build upon each other. So if you're going to make it already a great difference at fourth or fifth grade, imagine what it is at high school. And so with that change, shifting of the target, our percentages in SBAC have been pretty constant in the low 40s. So I can't, you can't do some multiplier. What I said where you can do, Alice, you can't do some sort of unit analysis like how do I multiply a, a certain amount percentage from an old test to a new test. I just can't compare the percentages. All I can tell you is that over our time in Washington Central, back to 98, we really haven't moved the needle in students being proficient. No, but you're saying we've moved the target. So we are actually teaching kids more. We just are hovering around the same percentage of what we're aiming for. I can't really say that because I can't do that analysis of what it was with the kneecap and with the SBAC. I can't compare those two because the targets have changed so much. I can't say that because they got 50% of it over here, it's 40% over here. I, I, I can't make that analysis. The tests don't test the same thing. So we've got Ruben, Floor, Darcy, and Katie, and I think we have to try to figure out. What I'm, it seems to me like what, what the sticky point here is that we're trying to compare learning to drive on a horse and buggy compared to learning to drive in 2018 with driverless cars on the road, right? Like you, you, if 50% of the people who took the driver's test in 1800 passed, and 50% today, there's no reasonable, uh, I don't but know. But algebra hasn't changed. Except that how we teach algebra, which is why we have all these parents grumbling about the math, has changed dramatically. I, I want to add, it's also the complexity of what we say to be proficient in algebra on an earlier test than what we say now. So what you have to come, uh, actually understand, is like pr procedurally being able to do a computation and able to apply it are two very different things. And, and I think further, to sort of pull us out of the weeds a little bit and get to something that's more like a board level goal, you know, something simple that we can aim for that I think we should demand, in fact, is that 100% of students in the SU make a year's worth of growth, right? Because if we're anything lower than 100% making one year's worth of growth, then that means that kids are falling off the back. And we know, period, that science, data, whatever, however you measure it, that kids who fall off the back don't do as well. And at the end of the day, our job as a public education system is to keep people from falling off the back of the path. So that's like that's a simple. We don't have to get into the how, but that's a that's a pretty clear goal that we can set for the SU. And then we could probably do something similar for some of these other things. Like, I, I don't know what those numbers look like. So. <coughs> Uh, 
Yeah, so I, I was just gonna say three things. The one is that, you know, I, I really appreciate the goals, like everybody, I agree with what everybody has said, I appreciate the, the goals. And the most exciting part for me is that I know that everybody understands that there's an urgency to get that on its way. So to me, what is most important is where are we right now so that we're managing for the present, but we're leading for the future. So, you know, and I'm not, I don't have any expertise in how to get that. So I, I have all the faith in the leadership team and the administrators that are been working on this. And I also, we want to say that I, I think we need to bring a little more student voice into this because, you know, from things that I, that I hear from students like, you know, my daughter has a couple of friends that are in India right now and, and they're getting basically killed in math. You know, like I, I graduated 30 years ago from a third world country and our math standard, like we never took the math tests from the US because they were, the expectation was so little. So I think we all know that we can, that we can do that. So we part from that. And then last, it's, it, and Carrie has said, has heard me say this at our, our quality meetings, like as, as much as I want math and I understand that we're gonna have to give up some things and that, you know, math needs to be taught minutes and all of that is that let's not forget the experience that that student has in to try to reach that outcome. So if we're truly talking about personalized learning, <coughs> that 60 minute might look different for a lot of students. There's some students that might need to do math in a different way. So I, you know, I'm not trying to look how to do it, but I, I think that to me it would be a mistake to completely get rid of music. which is just that I feel this push toward math and I feel the urgency of it and I know it's super important and that numeracy and literacy is are fundamental. <coughs> I don't, it feels like the conversation is like we need to, these kids to go to elementary school and learn math and literacy all day long. So I just want to make sure that yes, there will have to be some change in time or we're going to have to shift things, but we're teaching the whole child the child is learning so many important fundamental things, including numeracy and literacy, through activities that don't have the title of literacy or math on them. And I just want to make sure that I think Bill knows that's super important that we're looking at it in a more holistic way, um, just to keep bringing that into the conversation. What I really think we need to focus on is, you mentioned, Jen, that you looked in your meeting at research, what works in math instruction, what are the teaching practices that have proved effective, what is the time that we see at different age levels, how long can a kid actually sit and do a certain activity, um, and are the students ready to learn, because if a student is not comfortable and relaxed and open, and their mind is not there and open, they will not learn anything, and it doesn't matter what the teacher's doing. So, to me, that's where it, you know, you're working on all this professional development because as so many people have said, the fundamental chemistry in the classroom is that teacher with those kids, with their little minds wide open, ready to do math and excited about it. And we, Bill talks about making math fun and exciting and important and valuable. To me, it's not a theater performance, that's something totally different, but yeah, it's something you're excited to go to school and do with your peers and do with your teacher because your teacher makes you feel good and comfortable and successful, and you're getting something from it every day. Even if one kid's getting a little bit and somebody else is getting a lot, and the kids are helping each other with with what they've learned. Um, so I think just I think you guys are doing great work with the professional development, the coaching. But I have heard all of you say that there are teachers who are not there yet, or it's not consistent across our schools. That there's still more growth more work to be done. So I just, I'm really excited to see that work happening. And um, I don't think it needs to be that we suddenly become STEM schools or something like that. Kari? Yeah. yeah, I just wanted to take us back to our, um, our mission, right? We defined all the various things that we think are important for students, include other academic areas and transferable skills. But what we're wrestling with is where do math and literacy fall in the priority? Um, 
I want to go back to Allison's first question because I think it's really important to, to, to point out that we do have very specific targets in, in this goal. I think it's one of the strengths of it. So just if, if I haven't been clear, what we're really looking at is the column that's the June percentage of student proficient. And um, you know you can see it for each school. You can see an average for the SU at 71%. So that in the last column, uh, the number of uh, percentage of students making at least one year's growth. This is what we're saying. If we get a report sometime next summer, and we can and see that we met those targets, we'll be able to celebrate. If we don't, we want to do something else. But regardless, we're going to learn from that, and we're going to build on that, and, and take it to the next level. Because I, I don't think we'll be satisfied with 71% for forever. Uh, Chris, I'm going to try to get some up and time by way of so, Bill, in your description of the process that you and the leadership team went through, you talked about resources. So what additional resources uh, did you folks think about uh, and think you need in order to meet these goals? So we're actually pretty leery not to, take, to give a direct answer on that, Chris. Uh, and so we said to the executive committee, I said that we had sat and made a plan for this, that we haven't worked with our teachers on this. Uh, and I know that some of the board, the executive committee board members pushed back on that uh, and said, well, without a plan, why would we go forward with it? One of the things that we have had as a plan uh, in our work, it, and we've talked about this over the years, is increasing our number of instructional coaches. One of the things that we know, we've learned, Jen talked about our instructional coaching capacity, and she and Alicia have been really leading this for us, is that our coaches need to be building-based. Um, because coaching doesn't happen on a schedule. Coaching happens more on when I need you, or when the staff member has to be willing to do that. Um, we're, we're getting a cadre of folks together. We've been doing a lot of intensive PD on what it means to be a coach, and we've been able to add some, place, add some coaching services through federal grants whether uh, through the budget, the last year's budget in the supervisory union, and it's included in this year's budget, it's one FTE of a coach. Uh, we take money from Title II A, as well as we have some in the buildings, um, and some of the building school-wide programs. Uh, Doty has one that's there as well. The other place that I expressed to the committee uh, that is tenuous is our curriculum camp. Our curriculum camp is paid for by federal funds. We don't. We know about a year in advance if we have those funds. So we know for this summer, all our professional development that basically runs for teachers that isn't tied to the master agreement is coming through federal programs grants, and those are getting smaller. Our curriculum camp costs us about sixty thousand dollars a year to run. Um, our coaches are about eighty thousand dollars a piece. If we were to lose our federal funds. We'll be losing those positions and that our major resource, if I think like a business, all our research and development is being fed by federal money outside of the two hours on Wednesdays that we work in PD. Let me just follow up. Is there a sense of when um, you might have a, a clearer idea of a plan to fulfill these goals? I, I, so I don't have an actual date. We haven't had that discussion as a team. What we need to do to get out and have these discussions with our staffs. Right. And I'm just looking to the future as to yeah. the, in terms of budgetary issues. Right. So if I were thinking in budgetary and I wanted to go down that road, thinking off the cuff right now, so I just don't know exactly what it would be because I want to talk to my whole team, is to say, you know, we need to have a way that we look at what's already going on in Wednesday professional development. What can be put on hold? What discussions can we have with the staff? How can we ensure that all staff get the professional development? Then talked about the lab school. I can't tell you that all teachers of math have gone through that lab school. So we have to figure out how we require it. What time is that? So, and it's talking with our teachers. Not everybody needs the same type of professional development, so the method they receive it, and not everyone needs the same content, so we kind of have to do that inventory. I think that, that's a long way of saying, I 
I think it would take us probably six months for next year to have that a real detailed plan to that level where we have everyone partake in building the plan. As I reflected at the beginning of this, one of my big learnings in Washington Central over the past six years, if, every, if not everybody's involved, it makes it much harder to do. So in doing that, it's going slow to go fast later. Two seconds, okay. I just wanted to know if uh, you had a feeling for how the math pilot was going. So the math pilot, for those of you that don't remember that piece, is we're piloting new programs to support, so it's basically new resources to support instruction. A lot of people get confused that a math program, new set of textbooks, is your curriculum, and it isn't. There isn't a pilot that's gonna have, cover more than probably 70%, thanks for the head nod, I wanted to make sure I was in the right place, of what the curriculum calls for. Teachers are gonna have to augment. We know our teachers are working really hard to do that. We think we're gonna have something for elementary and middle, highs a year off, and Jen can tell you more and say we're just meeting. Yeah, so we have groups of teachers across the supervisory union, elementary, middle, and high school who are engaged in the math program pilot right now. We have piloted one program in elementary school and are looking at, um, at the likelihood of piloting two more. Uh, we've done the, the math, the, the budget math, right? So we know, um, we know that we could afford whichever one we decide is most aligned to our effective practices. The middle school is is piloting a program right now, and they'll pilot at least one more. And in math, uh, at the high school level, we've looked at two, and we just started looking at a third program as well. Um, there are, as you can imagine, advantages and disadvantages to every program that's out there. And um, what we want to do is make sure that we are making recommendations that are best aligned to our effective practices in mathematics and that we um, continue to develop our, our teachers' knowledge and skill professionally in addition to looking at a program as a resource because those two things do go hand in hand. Okay, thanks. It's, it is growing late and we have a whole other, well, several other things in our agenda still to do. Um, so I guess I want to try to suggest a, a possible way forward uh, from this conversation. So. If we could put the slide back up that has the four recommendations from the school quality committee. Um, so the first thing that I want to say is that, at least in my opinion, the first three recommendations here don't appear to me to be highly controversial. Um, so we're basically saying we want to adapt, adopt the set of math learning goals that the staff has already worked collaboratively together to set for themselves for this year. <coughs> So just to endorse or to adopt the, those goals. Uh, the second is to require comparable goals for literacy in the current school year, which I understand creates some work uh, for the whole team, um, but seems you know um, in line with the first goal and, and sort of you know hitting our a uh, couple of our top priorities. The third, I think, follows naturally from the first two. We want the data to be uh, gathered and analyzed and uh, assessed and discussed coming out of that, that process. So those three things don't seem uh, controversial, they also seem beneficial. It, 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 it's sort of, um, the goals that the, the staff, uh, the math instructors and the leadership team have set together, um, it's the first time that's really been done. Um, so you've got all, this, all the staff now looking at that data, considering it, thinking about, you know, sort of how to move students from one place to another over the course of the year. Uh, all of that is really valuable, and those three things reinforce that. So uh, I, I would hope that it's on our agenda, agenda that we would basically approve or commend these goals um, uh, going forward. I think that if we had a motion for each of those three things, we could discuss and probably you know vote on them. The fourth one, I think, is obviously more complicated um, because, and it says this in the memo, although we didn't quite talk about it in these terms, the fourth one really requires that the board be able to express what its priorities are. So if we're gonna ask the leadership team to go work with the staff to develop a three to five year plan for significantly improving student outcomes, they know what we're asking, what targets we're asking them to, 
to develop that plan too. Um, I know I have you know, personal sort of thoughts on this. I heard uh, Ruben sort of throw out 100%, you know, our students are achieving uh, one year's growth each year. Um, you know, I've suggested a goal in the past that's 80% of kids are proficient in, in math and literacy through tier one instruction. That sort of addresses a little bit of Scott, what you were talking about, it sort of emphasizes that the teachers are paramount in this and that we need to be developing our, our, our staff professionally and, and investing in that. Um, but I also, so I think that coming up with those priorities is important. I don't think we're gonna do that tonight. I, I would kind of ask that the, the SU board maybe, um, you know, tacitly charge the executive committee and the school quality committee with coming back with specific ones in January to, to discuss and to, you know, further and more specifics. Um, the one other thing that I wanted to say, will I be able to retrieve it? Um, I think you've done a wonderful job, Matthew. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, please. Yeah. Try to get him off the hook. Just quickly, I read that fourth bullet slightly differently. Okay. Just that, not that we will tonight create proposals, but that from the reflection in the third bullet, the team will, at the end of this whole process, at the end of the year, create proposals, right? Is that what you're saying? That's true, uh, although a couple things. Uh, one is that this really meeting hasn't been stated as clearly to, as it was at the executive committee meeting, but I, I felt, Bill, correct me if I'm wrong, I felt that the leadership team was really sort of putting the question back to the board about priorities I, I i and it was i think it's more myself saying to the boards and i would say the leadership team in some of our discussions when things you know when you're we get very much of discussions so you make tough decisions i would like to have it clearly stated from the boards what your priorities are and i know i've heard from some folks like hey no we said this i no i need the boards or board however you want to slice it to say these are our priorities, and East Montpelier, I want to commend them. They've done a good job when it came to interventions. They said you can look at anything else, but don't touch interventions. No, that's our priority. And let me try to I remember what I was going to say now. Thank you. Uh, I'm trying to illustrate this point with a couple of specific examples. So one thing that uh, that Bill did was sort of calculate. Um, let's say that we find that we actually need a longer school day. That there's no way for us to fit in all the sort of elements of, of education that are required to kind of you know, raise our, our proficiency um, uh, scores uh, that, that, that much higher. Um, well, we're lengthening the school day by half an hour costs a million dollars because that's just the cost of like the staff running the facilities, you know. So if we're going to put everything on the table and look at the entire system and examine every variable. If we want to put a literacy and math coach in every building, at least one. Uh, you know, if we want to make sure that um, all of our math teachers are certified to a certain degree and can demonstrate themselves uh, from an education standpoint, proficiency as instructors, so that we know they're they're able to use those uh, techniques in the classroom. We want to invest in a, in a sort of um, you know top um, student on training and professional development exercise at that level. Um, you know, that's a that's a governance challenge, it's a management challenge, it's a negotiations challenge, it's a budget challenge. So we all have to know what our priorities are so that when the inevitable pushback comes, whether it's from um, you know, staff who feel uncomfortable, whether it's from community members who say, hey, what's going on here? Why aren't we doing this as much as we used to do it and now we're doing less? Um, or from taxpayers and they say, why are we spending this money on, on all this stuff? Like, what are you even talking about? We all know why we're having that conversation conversation, what to say, um, and how to, to sort of move through those conversations. Um, so that's why this board, this priority setting exercise is not um, cosmetic. You know, it literally is a, a critical step in this process of goal setting and strategic planning uh, for the system over the long term. So, uh, yeah. Well, just on that note, I'm Kyle Landis Marinella from Middlesex because it has real world impacts in the schools. I think it's really important to have these conversations with community members and parents 
as well and with, with all teachers. I don't know if you only spoke with math and literacy teachers or if you spoke with art and music and PE teachers and everyone who else could be affected if things get prioritized. And there's actually a meeting in Middlesex tomorrow about this exact issue and uh, big changes that were made to our school this year that increased math time to 75 minutes and all the uh, negative impacts that can have on the rest of the curriculum and the whole child experience, all the stuff that Katie was talking about. So I think it's a bigger conversation that should involve community members as well, parents. Yeah, I agree. I, I heard Bill say 17 times probably now that uh, they haven't had a chance to talk to the staff, and it's they have to talk to the staff, all the staff, and engage them in this process. And I think that's why the goal, um, my understanding from attending the school quality committee meeting is that the reason the fourth goal has a date end of September 2019 is just a recognition of that it's going to take a long time to do that kind of engagement, um, you know, well and broadly enough. So my suggestion would be to be, you know, we look for motions for the, the three bullets uh, when we get to the action agenda, and then for the four when we come back to our Unless there's someone that has a, a brilliant or other points. Yeah. I was totally the pain here. I, I get the performance goal, but I don't see a set of math goals, so I still don't know what we're improving. I only see performance. I mean, I see all sorts of other ideas and things we should audit our report card data, but those aren't, but I don't see any clear goals. The goal is to reach uh, set, this whole set of so it's goals. One, so it's, it's just this, that it's right. just the performance. The, the, first one goal, thing. the first goal is just this guy. So it's not a set of learning goals, it's this one performance goal? Well, it's a set because it's by school, and it's also right. across the Okay. That's why it's called a set, yeah. Does that make sense? Totally. But if that's what it is, then great, I go. Got it. Okay, well, let's move on to uh, 3.4, uh, which is the reports from the Act 46 uh, subcommittees. And I would like to ask uh, the debt subcommittee to, to go first on this one. Well, uh, thank you. The, uh, that subcommittee uh, met uh, weekly uh, between when it was appointed and last week. Produced the report that's on page 21. Um, we we struggled to uh, find we struggled to find consensus uh, on many levels, both proposals the final product and also just consensus on why we were there and the future of the supervisory union and many 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 things um, but so the, the report is on page 21 and if you've read it and are thinking to yourself well I, I really don't see any concrete um, consensus proposals that emerged from the committee I think you're reading it correctly um, uh, we, we did we did brainstorm a number of proposals. I don't know that any of them are new, except for the first one, which is a, a new legislative um, idea initiative that's being looked at. But um, and so I'll, I'll leave it at that. And I I risk getting into sort of my personal opinion about the proposals if I discuss them much further. And that they are listed there and they are. Guys, I did review the report. We'll get to. I just want to stress that every one of the recommendations in here requires legislative action. Essentially, mm -hmm. is that correct? That, that's yeah. the crucial that's point. That's the crucial point. Yes, I think so. Meaning that that's accurate. Yes. Okay. Just want to be sure that I read it right. So, Scott, did you? Is that the point you wanted to make? That was the point I wanted to make. No matter how feeble, no matter how limited, everything requires legislative action. That some of them are um, legislative proposals that would affect the whole state. The first one is a le it is a legislative proposal, but it would be special legislation for our unified district only. 
So it is legislative, but it's it is specific to Washington Central. Is there anyone who can talk about why the in proposal one the envisioned legislative action would be limited to our supervisory union rather than potentially have a statewide impact? Is it because it's too late for so many SUs or new districts? Um, well, uh, proposal one is a proposal that is being looked at and developed by Representative Hansel. Um, so I, I mean, that, that's an answer right there. That, that's why it only relates to our, our supervisory union. But I suppose more specifically, um, uh, we, we seem to be fairly unique in our, um, in our challenge here about debt. And um, I, I'm not aware of, I'm not aware of any other communities or legislative legislators who are uh, interested in pushing the same or similar legislation in their communities. And, and what it is, just, just to summarize, uh, it's um, uh, in the new unified district, before it, every, every year when the tax rate is set, there would be an analysis to determine the effect of the debt from the high debt towns on the tax rate, and uh, that would be that effect would be phased in over a period of years. Uh, I think I think the proposal right now is five years, but that was just a, a number that was thrown out, and uh, and so for example, Worcester in year one would have a, a would face an, an, a, an increase of one fifth of the total amount face as a result of the debt in year one in the unified district. Second year would be two fifths invested and then gradually it would be up to um, this you know the rate as set in every other uh, district in the state. Thank you. No, I just want to say I have been on the committee the committee members did a great job. I mean we were headed to scum and there is no real latitude. I mean, we couldn't come up with alternatives that were legal. And it's a simple solution. I've said it a hundred, I won't go into it again. It's, it's a simple mathematical solution to get equity in this. It's not allowed under the law. Um, you can't, I think in the other solutions, if anything, they're just intended, like the phased solution, you know, maybe the, Towns that are hurt like this by Calus might recover 10% of the inequity, you know, which I don't call fair. You know, that's what. You know, so I mean, we really had our hands tied by, and it's just another problem with the whole consolidation legislation around this. I mean, this is, you know, I find all of the options, you know, not very acceptable. I mean, I think calculating that dollar in equity is fairly simple and it's also that is probably the closest thing you could get to being fair but not allowed so I don't you know how what do we advise the board to do I don't know you know we're kind of stall I would say is fight because it's it certainly is an equity and equity and then ultimately it hurts all five towns it will be it's going to be divisive it's a very divisive issue and then be no way out of that. I think we've tried divisive for the last three years, and I think we realized that under no circumstances is it going to work. And I think the time for digging in our heels and trying to fight City Hall is over. I think it's been clearly shown that the legislature has the power to do this, is going to do this, has done this, and it's done. And I think at this point, I, first I want to say I really appreciate that, um, I, I really appreciate the 
analysis of the proposals, there was clearly a lot of thought that went into this. And there was a lot of thought that went into the pros and cons that were very clear on it, and they were very clearly presented. And um, at the bottom line, we're in the corner. We're, we're where we are as a district. We were the model district for Act 46. The chance of the legislature making a carbon for us is somewhere in the not gonna happen. And I think, frankly, I find it incredibly frustrating personally that we spun our wheels for three years trying to, we could have spent the last three years doing something much more constructive than what we've done in my mind, um, which I just find incredibly frustrating. But the bottom line is that we're here. And, um, so I think the time is here for us to, to accept the reality of the situation and move forward as a cohesive whole and stop trying to find angles that are not going to work. So before we have that conversation, <laughs> uh, I'd like to just try to address the, the report from the Debt Committee. Um, and I do have a suggestion, maybe, for the group, uh, which is that um, I think the Articles Committee is going to continue to operate, assuming this board uh, you know, reuse its charge. Uh, and there will be a committee, I assume, uh, set up by the district boards as envisioned under Act 49 to draft and recommend articles of agreement uh, for voters to, to vote on. So we're going to have to have further discussion outside of this meeting about these different recommendations and what, if anything, we can do with Article 5. Um, so what I, I guess what I would suggest is rather than try to sit through the various proposals, which I know, is, you know Scott will tell you he's been dealing with for years already, it's you know, uh, just endless amounts of uh, discussion and ink have been spilled. Um, so rather than try to get into that tonight, that you know we, we just Whatever committee is sort of uh, finalizing uh, draft articles of agreement, you know, be charged with figuring out what's going to, what, what is going to be in them for Article Five, and call on the advice of the debt committee and, and work off of this this document, which is greatly appreciated. Um, but there's probably not not a lot of constructive purpose to trying to discuss it much more tonight, um, unless someone not Darcy. Go ahead. Go ahead. I just had one. So one of the things I struggled with on the deck committee was the quantifying exactly how much is going to affect each town or each individual. And that's then I, then I have to deal with um, income sensitivity. Because I think it's really going to be a hard thing to um, know until it happens. Because I think the number was like 76% um, of our community, 76% Sensitized, so that's a huge part of the community that probably won't be affected by this. Um, and so, I just I want that's what something I struggle for. Uh, Alan, when you're, I, I have to dispel this myth because it's been uttered for 20 years and it's wrong. When your school spending goes up for whatever reason. Even under income sensitivity, your tax bill will go up. It goes up the same proportion as your school spending per pupil is going up. So people are not protected in the sense that they will not see a tax increase because they're now, in the case of my town, shouldering a higher expense. Those of us who are income sensitized will pay more. The only time there is a cap and you can't have to pay more is if you're very low income and you fall under what used to be called the rebate program started back in the 1970s. And at that, that program, I think, caps your, the percentage at 5% of your income up to $52,000 that can go to both school and town taxes. Well, it started at 47, I think it was increased just the other year. 
So it's somewhere between 47 and 52. Um, that's the only time where if school spending goes up, you're not going to have to pay. That's, I don't think very many people in this room affected by that, that's pretty low income. But for the rest of us, most of us who are income sensitized, our tax bill will go up if per pupil spending goes up. Okay, does anybody else have any comments or want to suggest something other than what I put on the table, I guess, as a way to move forward with this? Just that it's part of drafting the articles of agreement for recommendation to ultimately the voters. So, yeah, well, just just one more comment uh, while the the whole board is, is together rather than in a, in a committee that's going to be drafting it, that's the only reason why I bring it up is um, been mentioned that um, you know the chances of uh, some sort of special legislation for Washington, Washington Central um, is slim, and I, I I don't you know I don't know what what the chances of that uh, is. Uh, all I know is what um, Representative Ansel told me, which is she I don't think that she's willing to push anything like this unless all five towns. I guess that means this. This board is um, on board with it. So um, I'll just um, leave the conversation there. Well, how would she know that? How would she know if everyone is on? Well, that, that's a good question. That's why I said uh, presumably this board. Uh, I guess that I guess it starts with this board. Um, would they float a resolution of some kind so that there's a sense of the Well, I guess we'd have to know what the proposal is. Before we can evaluate it and actually, you know, take a vote on it and state what our position would be on it. So, absent that information, I, I don't know how we would go about voting on it. And, and I don't know how concrete the proposal is, particularly in the years. Okay, I'd like to move to the articles committee. share with you guys today that we, we have a final draft of the Articles of Agreement from a donor Russo from the Agency of Education. There were a couple of things just to bring to your attention that had changed. Uh, one is in Article 9 that for the transitional board, uh, we can now, uh, as long as the board that is appointing uh, members to that board, they can appoint uh, two members, regardless of if the chair or the clerk, assuming that's what that board wants to do. So that's just a point of clarification. Then uh, the other the other thing that I wanted to point out is that we have, uh, the articles that we have worked so far, we have sent a draft to Chris Nuppel, and we're hoping to get something back by Thursday, if possible, maybe. But to have something on Friday that we would be doing a second reading, and then working on just the final four articles, and anything that we wanted to add to those articles. That is all, you know, sounds pretty but with that also we have to, uh, we're waiting for Donna to send us some information on uh, a, a guidance of how to best uh, work warning and doing all the requirements that we have for now. So we have, as you know, on the 30th, we were unified for real. Uh, and uh, we have 30, 40 days to, to do that warning. They're working on a, like a little cheat sheet for, uh, for all of the districts so that there's no questions on how best to go about the really best timeline. For uh, the way that, I, at least myself, I've been seeing it, to me, the most important work that this small committee, because they are not you know, representing every 
everybody quite yet, because we're not the transitional board, is we will pass these articles to the transitional board as a recommendation. As we have done all this work, this is where we are, so it's something more tangible that they can, that they can work with. And hopefully we can be, uh, they'll have done a quick timeline for us, and hopefully we could possibly vote in these articles uh, January to February. So for you and I haven't had a chance to talk since end of last week. So the past two days I've been working on this quite a bit. Um, and I don't know if you want me to go here now, Matthew, or not about. So the, I'm charged by the AOE to warrant a meeting of the district, of the, which means the whole five towns, to have a district meeting to bring together the transition board. Um, to be able to get it so that there's a vote on articles before February break, and the articles agreed, committee agreed should happen before the break. So I actually looked at the Tuesday, February 19th, I believe. I'm, gonna, I'm doing some of this from memory, so don't quote me on it. Um, that's the Tuesday before, thanks, Clark. We have to warn it 30 to 40 days before then, so we really need to have articles by the 18th of January done. And so to do that, we need a transition board working before then. So we would need to, I need to probably warn tomorrow, and I want to get through tonight, warn a district meeting for the first, somewhere between the 3rd of January and the 10th of January. I would like to get it as close to the 1st of January as possible. So then we can see the, the transition board and have the transition board be able to get put, put together a representative group. It has to be 706-like. It doesn't have to be 706 exact. That's what the legislate, that's what the articles say, which is different than what Act 49 says. I know there's some debate there. Uh, but I think it's fine to be like. And then after the warning for those articles, there are required public meetings that happen for, so people can learn about the articles. So we we got all that checklist you said we got done and I talked on my day and I have she sent it checklist? She hasn't sent it. I, I just have it. We, we, we're, we've been conferring on all the pieces that need to happen. So our, our hope is that by this Friday, we, we charge ourselves to get that. We come out of that meeting. So we have scheduled at 8.30 to 4. And then we come out of the meeting done with, with the recommendation. So I don't know if there's any questions. Just a couple of clarifying points on the timeline, I, I think. Um, one is that as I read the law, well, it's actually the existing you know, boards or districts that are being merged that would set up this committee yeah. um, to work on the Yes, yep. Yep. And then I, I also, if I read the law correctly, uh, that committee is required to have a public hearing on the draft articles actually before they would get warned for a vote, so that would have to happen also sometime. Yeah, I, I could have missed it, Matthew. I wanted to go back to make sure. Um, but in any case, it's a it's a breakneck kind of pace, you know, essentially to try to get everything lined up and, and done in time. But we do have a timeline and a plan essentially for doing that. So, um, any questions for Floyd? Yeah, I So there are a couple of actions, or at least one action, I know maybe two, I can't remember. One is that um, I thought the original charge for the articles committee actually expired today. Uh, so I wanted to ask the board to renew that charge so the committee can keep working. And then I also wanted this board to recommend uh, an action for charge to the district boards for their meeting in December about establishing the formal Act 49 section Ten subsection D paragraph one uh, committee to, uh, to formally do this work. Um, so that would be on the, uh, the action item also. <laughs> so uh, if there are folks here that are, have joined the board meeting to talk about Act 26 and you have something you'd like to say, this would be the time. Um, and I'll give you a minute to kind of weigh in. If you don't, that's fine too. We'll. Thanks. 
Uh, reports to the board. Executive committee we've mostly covered uh, already. Uh, so we'll move to financial reports. Special Ed Fund balance that was closed several years ago. I just left it here for no purposes. Um, the, the next one is the Office Equipment and Technology Fund, and you will see the growth there for the financial system. There's an increase of 100,000 in that fund. Um, that's where I've been the last few days, working with the state on transitioning to the statewide financial system. And it isn't free. There will be expenses in staffing and in other costs for programming to link some of their systems to what we have. Um, and then the uh, building capital fund that um, we have been working on that, um, maintaining it and increasing it for future needs, like for instance our mechanical systems. We've been in that office since 2009, so our building is 10, almost well, 9 years old. So. Over time, we're trying to do what other schools are, which is to have a capital fund that does not have to have a bond vote in order to maintain the vote. And the last one is the administrative fiscal agent fee fund balance, and that um, is decreasing over time. Um, it will be expected to be spent by the end of this year, and that is for us to do the work for community connections. Did I miss anything? Monday, but we didn't have a quorum and we were to work on our charge we took a little attempt at it and sent it out and there's not agreement upon the charge so we don't have a charge to present of what we're really doing okay thanks any questions uh, the school quality committee I think we have something else thanks for VSBA. So in the brief, I'll be brief because it's been a long meeting. Uh, but one thing is that there is uh, a training tomorrow for I sent it to the articles committee in case they want to join. There's still time and there's a training for uh, how to write articles of agreement tomorrow from six to seven. It's a webinar. You can take it anywhere you are. So if you're interested, just go to the VSBA website and sign in. Uh, and then the other thing I wanted to share with you is that uh, we just had our meeting on November 14th 
at the SMA when we started here with new members and when we elect our executive committee and we uh, sort of reflect in our priorities that are the, risk of the resolutions. So if, uh, if we also, Lucas and myself are your representatives, so if you have any questions or if you have any ideas or like please use the resources that the BSBA has. We, you know, we, we pay membership to the BSBA and it, the BSBA is pretty effective in working with all the learning partners, working with the principal association, working with the superintendent's association, working with the AOE and, and helping, you know, lead education in Vermont. And I think that's I have to say for now, and if there's any questions, please free to, to ask. Excellent. Uh, hearing no, no Johnny, yep. uh, Not a question, but just negotiations is on the annotated agenda, but not on this uh, one. So if you could just add it okay. in there. Johnny, would you like to give a report on negotiations? Um, so the negotiations team is in the process of negotiating a one-year contract and we've met twice to negotiate we have um, adopted ground rules we're using an interest-based bargaining which is a consensus-based uh, process for negotiating contractual agreements we have um, taken up the issue of how the contract addresses time, professional collaboration, and duties. Um, and we have made decisions about how we're gonna meet going forward. I wanna just note for this board that um, we will not have completed negotiations um, at the point when these transitions start to happen around the board structure. And there will need to be some decision making made and I don't know actually what entity or entities will have the authority to make decisions about potentially um, like one option may be delegating the task of completing the negotiations process to a group of people who may some of whom may become community volunteers rather than board members but that's something that should probably be um, considered for a, an agenda item at whatever point it's practical to do so. I, I don't have a proposal for when or where that should happen because I honestly don't know. Yeah, that's come up. I mean, I think that uh, at the very least it seems possible and likely that we would just appoint the representatives who are negotiating now to serve in that capacity that whatever board is responsible for that would do that. Um, but it's a little bit difficult to speculate. Seems to me like the most likely outcome. But, yeah. Thanks. Uh, does anybody have any comments about the administration report on page 33? Part of the packet. <coughs> Nobody's got one. They're ready to lob into the circle here. Then I'm going to assume there aren't any at the ready here. Okay, we have a motion actually. We're going to take off the table. The motion is, uh, I'll repeat it. Uh, this is made by uh, Peter and seconded by Chai. And it was to recommend uh, to the transitional transition board the approval of the WCSU 2019 to 2020 budget, totaling $9,287,455 assessed by equalized pupils. That is the motion. Uh, is there any discussion? Scott. Since we're in this very strange kind of Schrodinger's cat situation where we're both alive and dead at the same time, um, I wonder if I could suggest an amendment, not just for this one, but for all the way through, uh, just to hedge, and um, the amendment would begin approve for the supervisory union and member districts 
and recommend to the transition board of the merged district. So then, I mean, as everybody knows, there's a lawsuit that <clears throat> will um, at some point emerge, and who knows how that will play into all of this. But it seems to me the more economical we can be in our decision making so that we, to the extent that we can anticipate what happens, we've got the bases or the, the lines of, you know, the world lines covered. Um, it might just be, practically speaking, a useful thing. Okay. Right. It's your motion, Peter, so. So I think, Scott, what I heard you say is to. Um, that sounded like a friendly amendment. What? A friendly amendment. Would, would you take that as a friendly amendment? Yes. I'm just trying to make sure that I caught the wording of it myself. Yeah. So, um, to. Uh, how about to recommend for approval? and to the transitional transition board, something like that? Well, it was basically to approve for, oh, to approve for the supervisory union and member districts, just in case that is where we find ourselves in another month or two. Yeah, I mean, I honestly don't know how to structure a, a, a motion so that it becomes uh, viable in the case of like, you know, but yeah, but I got forked it. paths. So I just did the Scott, not to be caught on the microphone, but actually thinking about it for a minute, that Robert was going <coughs> in his grave right now. Uh, because Robert's rules are supposed to be clear directions with motions, and having two options within a motion is not in the spirit. I would have to go look at Robert's rules on that. I think you could have different motions to do both in the it have a motion that in the event of, whichever way you wanted the other one to take care of you, but I think having a motion that's, the, the spirit of Robert's rules is not to be ambiguous with your motions. And that's my, that's my opinion. Would it be acceptable to, to have a second motion to the effect of, rather than trying to include it embedded in this first one? Uh, whatever works, I mean. <laughs> okay. We could hear that. Uh, right. <laughs> I would suggest that we approve the budget. I don't really think we have to direct it at a transition committee. I, mean, I personally won't vote for this budget if it is directed at transmission committee or a transition committee, because I think that's illegal and it's challenged in court with very good legal backing. And I am an elected official from the town of Callis, and by God, I am not going to vote or approve anything that basically relinquishes control of their, what I can consider to be their property and their ownership. And so this, I mean, I, I want that on the record and I would like, I mean, I would say we approve the budget. If that transition committee ultimately ends up having authority, then they can take the budget that we created and use it as budget. Personally, won't relinquish that to them. Okay. So we do have a motion on the table to that effect. Um, we can make other motions, as we just discussed, uh, in the event of other uh, contingencies, but, uh, but at the moment the motion is to recommend. Uh, so are there any other comments or uh, discussion about that motion? Uh, no, I think that the, the, the discussion, and Scott, correct me if I'm wrong, was that um, if we wanted to approve the budget or have that language, approve the budget, uh, that we would do that in a, in a second uh, motion, which I imagine would be forthcoming um, shortly. Is that right? Yeah. I'll Whatever works. Whatever works. <laughs> yeah. What's the, what's the comment? So. I'll second that. Uh, we need a second. Uh, so all those in favor of approving this motion to recommend to the transition board the approval of uh, the WCSU 2019-2020 budget in the amount specified 
Uh, please signify by saying aye. 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 Uh, Opposed, no. No. Abstentions? Uh, the ayes appear to have it, and the motion carries. Um, I would entertain a, another, another motion on this topic, if there's interest to make one. Yeah. Scott? <laughs> a motion to approve the supervisory, the WCSU operating budget. Uh, okay, so uh, if a motion to approve the WCSU 2019-2020 budget totaling $9,287,405 assessed by equalized pupils. Does that sound right? Sounds good to me, Matthew. All right. Is there a second to that motion? A second, are all seconds. Okay. The discussion of this motion. Challenge, go ahead. Uh, this is a question for the process and legal people at the table. Is there any contradiction between the two motions or any reason we couldn't approve both of them? Motions are defined to separate legal entities. Uh, the motions are uh, addressed to separate legal entities. <coughs> legal entities no longer in existence, and it has no effect. All right. Would it be helpful to add the uh, phrase? Would it be helpful, Scott, to add a phrase to say, in the event of that a forced merger does not come to pass or something like that, just so that? Someone reading these two motions side by side and with no other context has some clue what we're trying to do here. Uh, if um, if uh, I have no objections. So that's in the form of a friendly amendment, I guess, and Scott, you sure. have no objections. So we're going to add a, a, a clause at the beginning. Um, uh, in the event that a forced merger does not is not realized, does not come to pass. Okay, uh, all those in favor of this motion, uh, in the event that a force merger does not come to pass, approving the WCSU uh, budget and the amount specified, uh, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions? Motion carries. Thank you. Uh, we need to uh, also recommend reserving the audited fund balances uh, to the transition board is on here. Seems like we may have a similar sort of issue come up with this one. Um, I have the motion language here. This is sort of standard that's been used in the past. Um, so I don't know if somebody is close to me here is interested in go for it. Number two. Uh, I move recommend a motion to recommend holding any audited fund balances as of June 30th, 2019 in reserve funds to be expended under the control and direction of the Washington Central School District, WCSD, for the purposes of operating the school district. Is there a second? That motion? Second. All right, thanks. Uh, I would just point out that this, there's no wording in this, uh, in this motion that specifies a transition board or not. So it seems to be applicable in all in all cases. Uh, is there any discussion of this motion? I'm sorry, Matthew. Yeah, go ahead. I could hear it. Can you just repeat it? Sure. The motion is to recommend holding any audited fund balances as of June 30th, 2019 in reserve funds to be expended under the control and direction of the Washington Central School District for the purposes of operating the school district. So this motion only goes to uh, the supervisory union fund balance, is that right? As opposed to individual town fund balances, and individual school board fund balances. I believe it's as to fund balances, correct? Yes. That's right. Okay. Why don't we look at the discussion? There's no further discussion. All those in favor of approving the, uh, the motion, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions? Motion carries. Thank you. Uh, 
5.3 is recommend approving the policy committee charge to the transition board. Because there isn't one. Okay, fair enough. So we'll uh, table that one, I guess. Um, 5.4 is recommend approving the school quality committee recommendation for a citywide goal related to student learning and transition board, which is a mouthful. Um, so yeah, Carrie, I don't know if you'd be interested to make motions to this, whatever way you feel is appropriate. <coughs> so I'll move that we uh, adopt the first three recommendations <coughs> for the school quality review. Okay. Okay. Is there a second? Second. Carl, second, thank you. Is there a discussion of that motion? So we're moving to recommend adoption of these for the local boards. Or are we adopting that as a broad-based policy that applies across the board? Okay. I mean across the whole the SU. SU board. It's a good question, Chris. What I, what I would say is that this motion is for the SU boards. And it's at the SU level that we're it's adopting it. I would personally recommend that the district boards actually put them on their agenda and take right. them up at their meetings in December right. okay. as well. Just yeah. clarification. Uh, if there is no further discussion, all those in favor of uh, approving the motion, please signify by saying aye. Aye. Uh, aye. Opposed? Abstentions? <coughs> the motion carries. Thank you. Um, extending the charge of the uh, articles committee. WCSU Articles Committee. Uh, so, so they can continue. So, they, so we can continue our work, yes. Um, hopefully not forever, but for a little while. Uh, so does anybody have a motion to make on this? I guess I'm thinking that you know, extending the uh, the existence of the I don't know, extending the uh, commission of the Articles Committee. Until sometime in January, I guess. Yeah, just to be safe. So, anybody has a care to make a motion on that? I would move that we extend the article, the charge of the articles committee, through January. Through January. Let's put a date on it. Just pick one. Until whatever transition. Why don't you just do the 31st, Peter? January, we're going to have to warn them if we have them. Say that again, please. Why don't you do it through the 31st? Uh, is, okay. is there a second to that motion? Uh, floor, thank you. Uh, any discussion of that motion? There you go. Discussion. All those in favor of the motion, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Extensions? Uh, we also need to, I think, recommend to the district boards uh, that they establish an Act 49 committee and charge it and appoint members. Um, I wrote a motion for this. Uh, I'll read it out. I, I have a tendency to overcomplicate motions, but I was trying to uh, reflect the language that is in Act 49 itself about the creation of this committee and what it should do, and also take into account the timeline. So. The motion reads this way. Um, the WCSU board recommends to the WCSU district boards that they approve the creation of a committee as specified in Act 49, Section 10, Subsection D, Paragraph 1, to draft articles of agreement for the new union district to be formed by the merger of the WCSU forming districts under the Vermont State Board of Education statewide plan issued on November 28, 2018. Said committee to be charged one, to hold at least one public hearing to consider and take comments on the draft articles of agreement on or before January X, 2019. And two, to communicate draft articles of agreement to the New Union District Transition Board and the WCSU District Boards by January X, 2019. Dates to be filled in, obviously. The committee will, be, will, will comprise six voting members, each WCSU District Board to appoint one member. So it's a long, long motion. Somebody wants to move it, we can do that. You said to put in dates. One member. Am I sure? The chair and the clerk. 
That's the transition board. We're talking about a committee oh. that would be uh, charged with drafting articles of agreement for possible consideration by voters at a public meeting in February. That's separate from the transition board. No, sort of. Uh, <laughs> it's a good question. So the, uh, the committee envisioned in Act 49, the language was clear, could not be created until the state board create, like, issued its statewide plan. So it's only now that they've done that that we can actually formally uh, create that committee. And the current committee is supposed to be formed in the same manner as a 706B committee, which is formed by the constituent districts, not by the SU board. So we created the Articles Committee that has been working just to be doing the work along the way until we have the opportunity to formally uh, establish this other committee. And I know that's incredibly confusing. Yes, it is. Yeah, Ruben. Is the makeup of the current Articles Committee, does it pass? Is it similar to this Act 49 committee? I would say taking Bill's language from before it is like enough. Uh, it is okay. like enough. You mean the the current committee? Yeah. So my, my yeah. next question is, could we just call this committee the Act 49 committee? And no, we could, but action is required by the district. I understood. Yeah. I'm just, I'm, I understand there's perhaps. some legal complexity, but I'm wondering operationally if we can just simplify it. By In my opinion, it. yes. That would be that, the that's easiest way. I suggested to Matthew that we have one member in the art in Act 49, it, it was very strict to 706B. In the draft articles that we received from the state board, it's alike. Okay. And I said I would suggest because speed is of the essence right now, that you keep the same six people at the table and let them do the work, and that you just take a leap of faith and say it's those six. We're going to do one from each board, each district. I think that the the, the uh, commissioning in charge of the committee by the district boards is a is a formality because we've already done it collectively, but it's a necessary formality according to the law. That's kind of how I've described it. So. Can I move the recommendation as you read it? If you give me dates, you can. Yeah. So <laughs> we have to. Uh, we have to hold a public hearing on it before January X date. I didn't know what the date was because I hadn't had a chance to, uh, let's say, be before January. Matthew? Yeah. I want to stop you. Go ahead. Of course. All right. Fair enough. OK. So uh, while Bill is uh, checking the timeline and such, uh, under future agenda items, I have educational priorities, which we're going to come back to. January. Um, are there any other items that people want to uh, catch on? Negotiations. Negotiations, okay. Specifically, um, specifically of, representation? I think we should at least have a placeholder for that. It may be that this board is not, I don't know where action needs to be taken, but it'd like, be nice to just have a placeholder for it or yeah. um, delegating that work. I make a motion that the existing negotiations committee be recommended to uh, continue their work with the transitional board. Yeah. Is that what you're looking for? Maybe. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, sorry, I this is, I'm not nearly as prepared as Matthew and hadn't thought about this um, and whether we ought prepared. to make a formal recommendation tonight. I believe that the transition board actually doesn't have the authority to negotiate on behalf of an union district. The new union district board will have that authority. So in, in a way, they, they can't appoint members to negotiations until until they've been seated, which we don't know when that's going to be yet. March seems likely, but if it happens that way, but, um, but yeah, so. so well, I think we can hold off on making the recommendation until January. Yeah, so there's no urgency about it, I don't think. But yes, Bill? Uh, before the 19th of January. The hearing. The 
uh, that hearing and that the board <coughs> report to the local boards okay. by the 19th of January. Because on your motion, that's why I came over your shoulder. I want to make sure how it, yeah, yeah. it said honor before, which is right. perfect. We needed the last date that we can do a 30 day warning to meet the February timeline is the 19th. So I even maybe one day more, say yeah, the 18th. That's, yeah. so the that's the last day. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So that's the last day a warning can go up. So we'll put January 18th into both those dates. Um, if people would like me to read the motion again, I can. Please do. Okay. Uh, the WCSU board recommends to the WCSU district boards that they approve the creation of a committee as specified in Act 49, Section 10, Subsection D, Paragraph 1, to draft articles of agreement for the new union district to be formed by the merger of the WCSU forming districts under the Vermont State Board of Education's statewide plan issued on November 28, 2018. Said committee to be charged, one, to hold at least one public hearing to consider and take comments on the draft articles of agreement on or before January 18, 2019. And two, to communicate draft articles of agreement to the new Union District Transition Board and the WCSU District Boards by January 18, 2019. The committee will comprise six voting members, each WCSU district board to appoint one member. And I will give you the wording on that. Lisa. Yeah, thanks. I'll move the recommendation as read. Is there a second? Ruben, thank you. Ruben seconds. Is there any more discussion of this motion? Yes. Uh, all those in favor of the motion, please signify by saying aye. Opposed? Abstentions? Motion carries. Thank you. Uh, are there any board comments or board communication? Yes, Kari first and then over to George. Thanks. I wish I had thought of this earlier, but I, I think it's high time that we come up with something to say about Act 46 to the, to the five towns. And I'm thinking probably of the best to leave it to the Articles Committee because they're going to have the timeline. And I think that's really a, a clear definitive statement and the timeline so people know what to expect and express that through Front Porch Forum and any other channels that are appropriate. Okay. So the Articles Committee can take that up on Friday. Okay. Thanks. Yeah, I just yeah, had a comment. Awesome. Thank you. Um, one thing I've been thinking a lot about uh, over really several years is we talk about equity, we talk about the importance of meeting kids where they are, and that's all to the good, and I'm 100% in support of that. But one thing that I can't seem to get over is knowing that in Vermont, and we know this, that essentially one in five kids in the state are facing poverty and are facing serious hunger issues. So one of the things that I would really love to see both this board and then as we barrel towards consolidation, the transition board and then the later board consider is thinking about having breakfasts and lunches that, that essentially families and kids directly won't have to pay for those things. That yes, the cost gets defrayed, we're gonna be spending a lot of money on a new track here at U32, you know, the priorities, we talk about priorities. Well, one of the priorities ought to be, in my opinion, any kid that comes to school that wants to have breakfast should have breakfast. And then wants to have lunch can have lunch, no matter their income. I think that's something that's really important. I think that's a statement we can make to everybody in the district and in the state and in the country. That let's feed our kids first. And when we talk about kids being prepared to learn, they're not sitting in the classroom hungry. To me, that's frankly unconscionable. And we can do something about that. And it's expensive. And I get it. Thank you. Okay, thanks. So we can put an item on the agenda of food security. Yes, I talked about that for the end of the days. Thanks. That's the educational priorities. Okay, thanks. Thanks. okay thanks for your patience. The meetings are not getting shorter. Um, we're trying, but they're not getting shorter. Uh, so the meeting is adjourned at uh, 7.58.